just um, welcome everyone to the um, Tuesday, September 8th school board meeting. If everyone could join me with the, in the Pledge of Allegiance. Are there any adjustments to the agenda, Alan? There is one addition. Uh, I don't know if it's been read on yours or not, but it would be 7G, and that's a consideration to approve district co curriculum mentors for teachers be positions, as when Mary Brown said to me the other day. Um, Coach, what about um, the, the timeline? Did we want to briefly? Just, I would think, under committee. Under pit, okay, great. Thanks. Um, okay. Um, a, Approval of school board minutes from the um, meeting on August 25th. Can I have a motion? I move that we approve the meetings for August 25th, 2009. Thank you, Rebecca. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mary. Mary. Any questions or comments or corrections to those? Seeing none, all those in favor? 6-0. Thank you. Um, we have some new student reps here from the high school today, and I'd like to welcome them. There are school board reps who were elected by their peers at the high school, and that's Matt McClavick and Julia Springer. Um, so welcome to both of you. I don't know, I don't want to put you on the spot this first meeting, but I didn't know if you guys had <laughs> anything. Warm, Matt, that you might do that. <laughs> if you guys had anything you'd like to report, um, or make any comments, or if you guys have anything you'd like to report about sort of the opening days of school. Um, I think I'm really excited, I guess, to be the string that attaches the uh, high school student body to the school board. And I think we can make a lot of improvements in the school through us, hopefully. Thank you, Julia. Matt, do you have anything you want to say? Um, nothing in particular. Just glad to be here. There's not much to report school-wise. We just got in about a week ago. So, so far, I think it's been a pretty smooth transition from summer. Well, we really appreciate your willingness to serve and represent your students your fellow students on the board. Um, comments from the public on non-agenda items. Is there anyone here who wishes to address the board on something that's not on the agenda? Okay, seeing none. Um, recognition. Alan, employees, your years of service. Yes, uh, that is in your packet. Uh, for uh, Employees for five years, 10 years, 15, 20, 25, 30, and 35. Uh, we have done it a little differently this year, mainly because of funding issues. Uh, so, all, so we have produced this list. Uh, this list is being published uh, to teachers, and we will be out there to give awards. We normally give them the first week of school, but uh, to be very honest with you, we did not have them ready at that time. But uh, we have, just so you know, we have two teachers who have been here for 35 years. We have one who's been a custodian who's been here for 30. We have uh, two, a teacher and a transportation person who's been here for 25 years. And then we have several at 20 years, a fairly long list of 15, 10, and the longest list is those who have been here for five years. Thank you, Alan, and thank you on behalf of the board to all those long-term employees. Um, staff summer work, Alan. Yes. See this notebook? Best staff summer work. I think it's always important for you to see this, and often you'll ask questions. But this book contains, and these are the newest ones that have just come in, uh, the summary of the summer work the staff has done. And what they do is uh, they make their application. It usually goes to the principals. Uh, usually it's around curriculum, instruction, or assessment, or data. Uh, then they do the work that is uh, needed. They put a copy in here. Uh, the principals review it, and I review it. And then it comes back to pay them. But I think it's important for you to see the enormous amount of work that has been done. And this document, these documents will be available for any of you to look at, will also be used uh, at some point this year as we start doing hopefully some television programs about what's going on in the school system. We'll be discussing some of these on that show. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Alan. Message to staff. Do you want to do my intro or should I? <laughs> You're, you got it. <laughs> um, on the opening day of school, as has been the tradition, the school board chair um, 
ad addresses the staff. And Alan had asked me to sort of give a quick summary of or recap of my comments from that morning. And I'm not going to read it. I don't want to bore people, particularly the staff who might be watching at home. But the theme that I spoke about was risk taking and mistake making and how important that it is. It is to do that. Um, I pinpointed some of the work that we, our CIA team has done. Um, and all of that work entails risk. It's the departure from what's been done in the past. There, it's shifting some of our cultural dynamics, but it's so important. And throughout the process of doing that work, um, I'm sure mistakes have been made and will continue to be made, and that's okay. One of the quotes that I thought that I used in the, um, my comments and I thought was really interesting was by uh, author John Holt, Jr. And he said, if you're not making mistakes, you're not taking risks. And that means you're not going anywhere. The key is to make mistakes faster than the competition so you have more chances to learn and win. Um, I also put um, risk taking in the context of some of the te technology work that the school district has done. The school board has focused its attention and, and financial resources on technology and that um, holds opportunities as well as um, potential pitfalls, I guess, if you will. Um, it'll identify what we do well in areas that need improvement and that's okay also, it's forward movement. I also spoke about um, the fact that there are many business leaders who contend that the engine that will drive the U.S. economy um, are startups and entrepreneurship. And what those types of entities need are bold leaders who can take risks and challenge convention conventional wisdom. Our school systems now are preparing these leaders today. We must take risks and encourage our students to do so. We must also remind ourselves and our students that risk taking is inherently prone to failure. It's not called sure thing taking. Um, there's a lot of great things going on in our schools. They offer lots of opportunities, but they also involve risk and thus the possibility of failure, but that's okay. As Henry Ford said, failure is only the opportunity to begin again only more wisely. And in conclusion, our district's mission is to ensure that all of our students develop the knowledge, skills, behaviors, and attitudes to become successful individuals and students. I think it's good to remind ourselves of that. But we can't possibly achieve this without applying to that, without extending ourselves for that hard to reach student, participating in super challenging professional development seminars, encouraging our students to reach, or whatever it is that holds the promise of success and the th threat of failure for each of us. So I encourage the staff and ourselves to look inward and to encourage our students to take some risks, know that we'll make mistakes, um, but it, that's good for all of us. So Now I'll speak to you. Okay. <laughs> that was the synopsis. It's not as eloquent as I hope well I done. sounded the first time I delivered it. But <laughs> I, think, I think it's important for the public to know that after she gave that presentation, she had a standing ovation from the entire teaching staff. Which I think, and not only teaching staff, we had all staff there. And I think that's extremely important to know. From the point of being a superintendent, I will tell you that when you first become a superintendent, you usually are the one who has to get up there and give all of the messages and get everybody going. As each year's gone, I've tried to get more and more people to play a role in that. Trish did a, and a superb job. Uh, I would also th thank uh, Dwight Ely who came as the uh, CEA representative and did an excellent job as well. And then we had Seif. And uh, you all can understand what Seif did for that entire crowd. It was just an amazing presentation. But the other piece that I think was extremely important is it's where we introduced the wellness plan and how it can be used on a day-to-day -day purpose. And we did that for three days. And as we get to the opening days of school and the communication, I'll talk about that a little more. But uh, I'm, I am very pleased with that first day, but also with the first four days. And we'll give you a little more information when we get to that subject as we go along. But uh, the messages that come from the board are extremely important because you set the guidelines. And if it is ever viewed that the superintendent is going one way and the board going another and the administrator is going another, you can be in a lot of trouble. And we're very clear that we're all working together for the young people of Cape Elizabeth. So I truly appreciated that. And thank you. Thank you. Um, and I think that was a great segue yes. into the wellness, <laughs> into um, the next section is Let's Go presentation.
So actually, I was going to say, speaking of wellness, we probably wouldn't be where we are with wellness without two um, extraordinary, I'll call them positive change agents and leaders in the greater Portland area. And today we have Tori Rogers and Heidi Kessler from Let's Go here to speak to us, um, give us an update on the Let's Go initiative in our school district. So thank you all very much for coming. This was their idea, and I'm very excited to see <laughs> what they're going to present. Great. <clears throat> well, thank you very much. I'm going to start an echoing. Um, there you go. Maybe better. Um, so it, it really actually wasn't our idea. Um, it, is it still echoing? A little bit. It's the microphone. I think oh, it's okay. Um, it really was the idea that when we go out to schools, the, the teachers and the parents say to us, it's great, Tori, that you come and talk to us, engage us, and talk to us about obesity and talk about these things, but you need to be talking to the school boards. I said, oh, okay. So we put out a, a call to all the school um, districts in the greater Portland area and said we'd like to come and talk. And I have to tell you, it's been overwhelming. We're, you know, um, have a little traveling road show. You're our first. So what we want to do with this is give you a little update about Let's Go. I think you know about it. I also think you know about 5, 2, and 0. But we want to give you an update on it. Also, um, activate you. I really liked what the... Um, Chairman said what you said about you know taking risks. Uh, anybody who knows me, we we constantly the, the, where I work, we take risks, we try new things, we fail sometimes, and sometimes we um, we make it right. So I think that's going to how I'm going to end. Also, is to challenge you guys that we all need to sort of step up to the plate on this one. So, so I'm going to talk just briefly about the obesity epidemic. The only reason I'm going to talk about that, I'm going to look at both of this, because I feel like I'm talking to you guys too, is because without the obesity epidemic, without 30% to 40% of adults carrying extra weight and the same percentage of kids carrying extra weight, I wouldn't be here. It gives me the platform to talk about healthy eating and physical activity. I'm going to talk about Let's Go and our 520 Goes to School, and then use some current data that's coming out. We'll have a lot more data later on this fall. Who has seen these slides? I know some of you, like Karen, has heard me talk before, have seen these slides. These are from the CDC that depict the obesity epidemic. Can you guys raise your hands if people have seen them? A couple of things for me, but you guys have. So what these are, and I think this is important, this is self-reported data for um, adults um, throughout the United States, started back in 1985 from the CDC. And what you can see there is a lot of states didn't have any data. And then the light blue, less than 10% of the population is obese. And then you can see the different percentages there. I'm going to go through these pretty quickly. And what you're going to see is all the states are going to fill in. And it's pretty remarkable. I, I'm a pediatrician, public health. I do work here. I do a lot of work nationally on this. This is an epidemic. You think H1N1 is a problem. I guarantee you this is a bigger problem. So here you go. So this is the data, and you can start to see it gets blue. It's not anything to do with politics here. But now we're about 15 to 19 percent, that's that dark blue, of adults who are carrying extra weight. Now this isn't just a little extra weight. It's not the 10 pounds you want to lose. This is 40, 50, 60, 100 extra pounds. So now you keep on going, and now we get extra colors in here. So these colors now, that sort of you know, yellowy color, is greater than 20 percent of adults are carrying extra weight. Again, a lot of extra weight. And now look at this. So this, this is um, uh, down here, this is Mississippi. So in 2001, greater than 25% of the adults. This is data for kids trend the same way that we don't do self-reported data. But I can show you that if anybody ever wants. So now watch. We go from blue to red pretty quickly here. Pretty dark, I have to tell you. This is why I care about what we sell in the softball shack. This is what I care about what we're feeding kids in our cafeterias. This is why I care that Elaine does physical activity for a reward and doesn't use food anymore. This is why I'm going to school boards, because of this. And I think it's important to stop. It's not just because we're big boned in Maine. It's because we're carrying extra weight that puts risk at our heart and, and puts risk for diabetes and mental health. And I can go on and on, but I know I only have 15 minutes. So. Um, so what does it look like in Maine? Maine, we look pretty much like the rest of the country. 61% of adults are either overweight or obese. So that's the obese was on the previous slide. So 61% of adults are carrying extra weight in Maine. 36% of Maine kindergartners are. 27% of high school students. And the economic cost is $2.13 billion, billion with a B, economic cost annually to the state of Maine. That's healthcare costs, that's economic costs, that's disability costs, that's lost productivity. 
So when I talk to people, you can cut it any way you want. You can care because it's too much weight and it's health related. You can care for the economics. You can care for, you can look at school grades. Any way you look at this, this affects us all. So that's the bad news. The good news is um, we are doing a lot in Maine. We're actually leading in Maine. I, again, work across the country on this, and people are calling us. Today are calls from um, New Hampshire and North Carolina and California. What are you guys doing? I hear you guys doing some cool stuff in your schools. So this is a Let's Go project. I think you guys have seen it. This is my new favorite picture because it shows the different sectors of Let's Go. I'm here at the school to talk to you, but I also talk to anybody who will listen on this. So we do a lot of work in healthcare. The reason Let's Go has been successful is because we're working in all of the It's not you, it's a radio transmission. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing that's important here is we had seven innovative um, people willing to take risks, um, just like you guys talked about, businesses and healthcare organizations that stood up to the plate. Yes. 5210 goes to school is the school part of that puzzle piece. And that's funded differently. It's by the Barbara Children's Hospital, where I work, the Proctor Foundation, Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare. So these are the numbers, which I think some of you have seen before. And the really important things about these numbers are this is where the evidence sets. If you really want to work on getting kids healthy and adults, I might add, these are just the starting numbers. It's five or more servings of fruits and vegetables, two hours or less. Don't let kids let you say that they need to do two hours. It's one hour or more of physical activity. And the zero message is my favorite number because the new data that's coming out, American Heart Association just had an amazing article about how much sugar we all eat. But the most important part was that how much sugar we all drink. So just if I, if, when I have an opportunity to talk to kids, if they want to work on this, it's one thing you can do is just think about what you're drinking. I'm looking for the gentleman in the back who's got something he's drinking. <laughs> <laughs> so what does 5 times year goes to school? What we offer, and I think you know, is some expertise. We have a great group of people who are really um, experts in education that we work with and around this area. We offer toolkits and funding in Greater Portland. But the really cool thing is we offer flexibility. When we started working with Kate, we didn't say, here's what you have to do. We listened to Karen and Rebecca and other people and said, this is, and you guys said, this is what we want to do. And we said, okay, cool, a little different. And so that's what we offer, which we think is very different. And clearly we are learning and stumbling along the way. So I'm going to turn it over to Heidi, and Heidi's going to talk about some Cape highlights, and then we'll do a little bit of data. I'd be fun to share just a little bit about what I've witnessed from Cape Elizabeth over the past two years. Um, really exciting part of my job is that I get to see the way that all the districts in the Greater Portland region embrace 5200 to school, and I get to see how they implement it. Hi. I'm very sorry. The only reason why I want you to move over there is because then everyone who's watching on television will be able to hear you. Okay. Um, so it's been wonderful watching, getting to watch Cape Elizabeth embrace this program and see how they apply it to their unique needs of their schools. Um, Cape Elizabeth is really lucky to have some outstanding champions who are dedicated and committed to the cause of health and wellness for their youth. Um, Karen Burke was absolutely instrumental in bringing uh, Let's Go 5210 Goes to School on board swiftly and efficiently. Um, very quickly, Paula Harris and Elaine Broussard, and in her new role, Gretchen McCloy as well, came on board and have been um, outstanding champions and outstanding uh, pushers on this initiative in their schools. Um, I'd like to say that these four individuals are absolute catalysts for a culture change to happen in Cape Elizabeth. The cafeteria renovations that have happened in the high school, I want you guys to know that there are schools from around the state calling me and probably calling you guys as well, trying to find out how did this happen? How did they do this at Cape Elizabeth? Um, it certainly wasn't one person, one school nutrition director, one school board vendor, um, member, just one person in the school. It was truly a collaborative effort. The staff wellness that's happening at Cape Elizabeth is beginning to um, really blow my mind as well. It's been very impressive. I recently heard that 145 teachers and staff members participated in the most recent staff day, staff wellness day. Um, I've been getting reports that it's promoting community and collaboration among staff, which is incredibly important, as you know, for the students. I wanted to say that probably one of the neatest things that I've learned from Cape Elizabeth is that um, these folks have taught me that you can regularly look beyond your walls to your greater community to see not only how the schools can gain um, useful things from the community, but how the community, but how the schools can give back to the community as well. It's been really impressive to see that happen from the start. 
it might be surprising to realize how hard it is sometimes to get schools to look beyond their, beyond their own walls to see what else is out there. So I guess what I want to do is um, I like to think about the ways that we can encourage and support the work that's happening on the ground level to make sure that it's really long lasting and sustainable. Just show you a couple of data slides. So I, I have to tell you that it has been really fun to sort of watch Kate grow and to watch all of you guys. And um, it's been really great. I've gone to a lot of your meetings, and uh, I remember the first meeting that we went to for the um, cafeteria at the school with all the kids and stuff. It was great. It was really great. And we take all these lessons learned and go to other schools. So, um, so is it making a difference? Well, again, I can share just a couple data points with you. This one is interesting because what we ask is administrators, principals, superintendents on the different areas where 510 has helped you make a difference. Um, and we know that there are a lot of other activities and initiatives going in school, but you can see a number of different areas. We highlighted the school environment because I actually think that's very, very important. This really isn't about what a single teacher or a school nurse does in a school. It's about their work that they do, how you guys can support it, how you can make the environment and policy change, which then makes sure that if one of these great champions goes to another school, all this good work doesn't go down the drain. So the school environment piece was very interesting to us. Now, we, this one's really interesting, the role of the school. This is from a telephone survey that we did in the greater Portland area in um, April and May of this year, 800 parents, and we asked them whose role it is to address healthy habits and obesity. And a couple of things that are really striking for me. First of all, they think it's a very urgent need. Secondly, schools and healthcare, you and me, we've got to figure this one out. They don't take, you know, parents clearly, we have a role, I'm a parent of a high schooler and a middle schooler, but you can say they, are, they really are defined at the school because the kids spend so much time there, and healthcare has to have a role to play. We also asked about school policies, which I know can be kind of a difficult um, realm, and we asked if they would support formal policies, and one of the things that I think is really important is overwhelmingly, 77 to 75 percent, that they would support formal policies, increasing physical education in schools, which you know there have been a number of trials like that, and also getting rid of um, the sale of junk food in um, the vending machines. So moving forward, where we want to go with Let's Go is we were been working with school nutrition directors for the number of years, um, two years, and this coming year we have put a plan together with them for any of the nutrition directors in the greater Portland area. We're currently working with seven out of the 11 um, to address the nutritional quality of foods, to um, market the program to students, families, and staff. It's actually pretty good to eat there, though none of us, a lot of us don't always think that. And also understanding the complex business model. I think that that's really interesting that I didn't know until I got into this. How we're going to do it is a coordinated uh, communication campaign. We've asked the cafeterias to do the following things, eliminating whole and 2% milk. You may not think that's a big deal. That is a big deal, especially in the younger grades. And limiting the um, availability of French fries or similar, uh, similar potato products, as they call them. And desserts to no more than once a week. Now, I'm going to stop here because I, you know, I, and the nutrition directors are good friends of mine, but this is really important. I don't serve french fries and brownies every night in my house, and I suspect most of you don't either. So our cafeterias shouldn't be serving these kinds of foods. They're very high caloric. Um, and then the last one I think is also very important, living the competitive foods, which as you know sometimes balance the budget. We shouldn't be balancing the budget on the backs of our kids. So our ask to you is um, really, we're asking you to stand up and visibly support the work of these champions. Um, as they continue to do this work, they are incredible. And they've asked for your support, and I think what I've heard today, you guys are definitely doing that. I think the leadership is so important, and I, I want to say that we're all part of the solution. Whether we work a softball shack, which I have to work from time to time and sell that food, I'm actively working in SACO to change that. Or whether as a parent, or as a soccer mom, or as a pediatrician, a school board member, we all have a role to play. If we can think about the small changes that we can do, and then those of us who have the opportunity to stand up and use your voice, and say, no more of this. How can we do things better? So that's what we wanted to present to you today. And thank you for the time. And we're happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Yeah, and, I, and I just wanted to thank and reiterate once again what, um, what wonderful instigators they were. And it was really because of some of the mini grant money or the grant money we received from you that we were able to spearhead several of the initiatives within each level. So um, you, you were instrumental. And, and Cape Elizabeth would like to thank you. Do you need this more, Alan? No, you can just shut it down. Unless you want to do some paperwork. I was thinking 
<laughs> Thank you very There's much. Plenty there. Again, does anyone have any other questions or comments before we move on? I was just going to say good luck when you go and you speak to the other communities. Yes, we're excited about it. Yeah, we're excited to share, and we'll share what Cape is doing. So we'll let you guys know. Thanks, Rebecca. Is there a way that we could maybe have a copy of some of that data that you showed us at the beginning? Um, the, the, the slides? The yeah, electronically. Absolutely. After, we can, I think. Yeah, there's a couple things we can do. We, we actually have a bigger presentation I did at a symposium um, in the springtime that shows a lot of that mm -hmm. data and also the, um, how we got here. So mm -hmm. we're happy to share that. It's actually on our website, isn't the symposium? Yes, it is. So if you go to letsgo.org and you go into education, if you can't find it, just email me and I'll get it to you. Okay. That'd be great. great. And then the, the rest of the data, um, the, our full evaluation will be available in November, and we're going to send you guys a copy of what that looks like. Perhaps if I could just take a few minutes before we do the opening days of school. I have three letters here from teachers, which I think are, are important for them to hear before they leave, and also for the public as a whole. And so if you'll give me a few minutes, I'd just like to read these. Uh, one is from a middle school teacher. I didn't ask them uh, if I could read them with their names on them, so I didn't, so don't be. <laughs> it says, please extend my sincere thanks to the Wellness Committee for all the work that they did to organize and implement the wonderful activities that were available this week. It was terrific to have the opportunity to try a variety of new activities from pilates to sea kayaking. One of the benefits was to meet members of the faculty from other schools uh, everyone was so enthusiastic. Many of us hope to extend the experience by having Zumba class at the middle school this fall. Additionally, thank you for providing meals during the week. The food choices that the food service staff prepared were delicious. Scheduling everything at the high school cafeteria gave all of us a chance to spend some time with a variety of faculty members from the other schools. All of the professional development events were excellent. As I mentioned to you, during one lunch we were all discussing Ross Green's Plan B. Uh, the technology workshop that Gary organized was very informative and effective. Many people commented about how they would be using what they learned during the coming weeks. All in all, I thought it was a great week. Your careful planning gave us the time to reconnect with colleagues, learn about new in initiatives, try new health activities, and join with the professionals for delicious meals. Thanks for a wonderful week. Here's to another great year. Which I think is a wonderful letter to just summarize where we were. Another uh, person wrote, just wanted to share some positive feedback with you regarding the wellness programming that took place during teacher days. I think this was a wonderful opportunity not only for staff to get started or upgrade skills across a number of activities, but equally as important to learn and play with a new cross-section of staff. I think it created a real sense of camaraderie and collectiveness that I was proud to be a part of. Adding periodic opportunities for more wellness activities throughout the year on teacher days would be, great, would be a great way to continue cross school connections and foster a sense of real teamwork. To the Wellness Committee, job well done. Keep up the great work. And the third one uh, is uh, from uh, somebody on our foreign language staff. As you may recall, my 0809 flex time was spent on exploring technology resources. Some of these resources I was able to post right on my website and others will come later. I also wanted to say that I enjoyed this year's teacher days with the wellness activities, Ross Green presentation, and the technology day. Ross Green was very insightful, and I learned just what I wanted to know how to do in terms of technology. Thanks for a great beginning of the year. And so those were three letters that I, I got uh, within the next few days after we did this that I think point to the fact that we did something that was highly valuable and well used and gave many different opportunities besides wellness, to hear different presentations and what were said, et cetera, and really got back to the issue of how do we get some time to really talk together and work together. So I was, I was very pleased uh, with the comments that, that we received. Thank you again. Thank you, Alan. And I think that's also a good segue into your opening days of school. <laughs> uh, and as you know, thank you very much for coming. As you know, this year we did something very different. Uh, normally we have either a couple of days before school starts. This year we took four full days, which was a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Uh, on Tuesday, uh, I did a brief introduction. As I said, Trish spoke. Uh, we also had Dwight speak and also had the uh, CIF committee come in and speak. Then teachers went off to their buildings for meetings and to get their rooms ready. We did it on that day mainly because a lot of times when teachers go into their classrooms, they pull things out into the hall that they want thrown away. And if we had them do it on Friday, we would have never been able to get it cleaned up. 
So that worked really well. The next day, we had Ross Green come in. And Don, would you be willing to just speak for a minute about Ross Green and his visit here? Dom was the one who arranged this process for us. And while he's coming, I did say to Ra uh, Dom, he better be good. <laughs> and he was. So, <clears throat> so um, Ross Green came to us on Wednesday. Uh, he has worked around the state. He's in the, I don't know if, you, if anybody knows about this, but he's in the correctional um, units both here in Portland and in Bangor. Um, he's really devoted to Maine. He wants to move here. So he did give us a really good deal. Um, for 3500 bucks, he came and he presented to us um, basically around Explosive Child, which was his first book, but also Lost at School, gave us some really good statistics, and then really went into his whole uh, philosophy around collaborative problem solving and using A, B, C techniques and so forth. Um, a lot of great feedback from staff. A lot of staff are trained in this. Other, um, some people have seen them in more advanced sections, but I think overall it gave a lot of them, I think mainstream teaches some good um, tools for the toolbox to help out. So, that's so thank you very much. So, and oh, he will be. I think the DLT is going to be working to see how we want to use him to come back um, to help out and keep facilitating um, his that process of problem solving. I think I'm safe to say this that he really liked Cape Elizabeth, and so he was very uh, agreeable as we talked to him at the end. Uh, Dom and I stayed with him for a while afterwards, and so I think he can offer us some amazing work. Uh, as the year and next year go on. Uh, thank you, Don. Uh, the next day, we did uh, uh, worked on curriculum instruction and assessment. We worked in our groups uh, across the system. Uh, I worked with the five groups I'm working with. Everyone else worked with their groups. Some of the groups worked on their own. Some of the people were working on textbooks and what they, what they needed in order to carry go forward. Uh, some were working on actual lessons. And some were, in particularly in the groups I have, which are the groups that are not in that central, central core, were really pulling our uh, documentation together. And we had some excellent work done by the end of that day, which I'm very pleased to see. And on Friday, Gary Lenoy did the technology piece. He had a well-known speaker come in first thing in the morning. And then he had two sessions where teachers could choose anything they wanted to choose. To, to learn how to do certain things. Uh, they could choose two very different things. They could choose two things that were much alike, et cetera. And I think, again, it gave them an opportunity to do that. But I would say to you that these days would not have been nearly as successful if we had not had the wellness opportunities that were offered at 6.30 in the morning. Am I right on that? At 3.30 in the afternoon, and one day we did it at noontime. And also, the wellness committee did lunch on the very first day. And so all of those pieces just added another part of that whole puzzle. And the other piece to that was that staff had a chance to sit together, talk together, laugh together, joke together, plan together. Pieces that we don't normally get the chance to do. And so those four days, I felt were very successful. Now, somebody will look at me and say, did all the teachers feel that way? Probably not. Uh, as, as everybody, we reflect on it, everybody can find some reason to perhaps not be as happy. But certainly, nine-tenths of the information I have received, and Gary did a really nice survey, which you will get in the next few days to see how it went. I think it was a great opportunity, a new opportunity, to answer some of the questions that people had. And so I was, I was very pleased, and uh, I, th I hope all of my administrators and teachers who were there found it a very valuable day as well. Um, thank you, Alan. <laughs> Any questions before we move on? We have a long list here, so yes, I do. jump up and down if you have questions. Um, H1N1. Oh, H1N1. Certainly, I, I'm sure Paula would agree with me, one of the greatest joys in our lives <laughs> in the work that we are doing with this. Um, H1N1. If you've been watching the news very carefully, if you've been listening to what's going on, uh, it offers some problems for us and some decisions that we need to make and make carefully. Yes? You know what? I'm sorry, Janet. Janet Hoskin was not mentioned on my part. I apologize. Her wellness, oh. her role as a community services director throughout that whole wonderful initial week, we could not have done it without you because you help bring in all of the instructors, you know, for free and the time and the schedule. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And I would agree with you too. Yes, yes, yes definitely, yes. definitely. 
So, but Janet, we won't include you in the H1N1 <laughs> right this minute. Goodness knows it may not stay away for long. Uh, the, the things that I would like to say to you, I have sent you notices about where we are at this point in time, but just a few things I want you to understand. Number one, I think it's extremely important for you to know that we have 15 staff members, including the three nurses, our doctor, the administrators, Jeff Thorak, uh, Gary Lenoy, Janet, uh, Dom, who are, and Pauline, who meet with me every single Friday from 7.30 in the morning until 9 to take a look at the latest changes that are going on with H1N1. Besides that, I am also serving on a Cumberland County group at Maine Medical Center with doctors and nurses up there to take a look at where we are. This process, I would say right up front, and I, I'm sure Paula will agree with me, is nothing I was ever trained to do. And so we are all learning, and learning very quickly, and sometimes learning that we've taken this road, and suddenly we need to come back and go that road, or we may have to go halfway through. But I, I would say to you very clearly, and I think the citizens need to know it, because of these 15 people and the time and energy they're willing to put into this, the questions they bring in, the concerns they bring in, et cetera, are very important. So I feel very strongly, and I say this as a superintendent in Cape Elizabeth, I think we will have one of the best organized and planned programs for this process. And I'm very happy to be working with Maine Medical Center because I'm also getting a level of information that we would not have otherwise. Uh, we have got a lot of hard work to go ahead. Uh, we meet this Friday uh, to take a look at the next steps along the way. The uh, annual flu shots should be coming up in two weeks, so we are moving very quickly to deal with that. We are attempting to make it happen in a way so that, number one, it does not happen in our schools but in another building uh, in the town. We're also looking at a Friday because that's a day when uh, Pond Cove has an early release day, and therefore parents who really want to be with their kids can be with their kids as they get that first shot and go through that process. I'm very clear, the nurses and I have talked a lot, the last thing nurses want to do is be giving the shots themselves because it changes the picture of what nursing is all about in the school system. So we have a group out of Saco who are coming in to do all of this work. Uh, we are supplies, I just heard today, I haven't had a chance to talk with the nurses, our supplies are going to come through in the right numbers so we aren't going to have to buy a lot of extra things in order to make this happen. Uh, I did receive word today, there are groups out there, like with everything we do, that are fighting this. And I turned all that information over to CDC because I'm not a medical person. And I'm not going to argue with people about what the cause, what might or, occur because of the shots. So CDC and Dr. Dora Mills are dealing with that. Uh, the people who I'm dealing with at Maine Medical Center have also responded and will be attending public meetings that are working against the vaccinations. I'm not the medical person. I don't have the insight, so they will be doing that. But again, I just, I just need to say from the viewpoint of somebody who's been here for five years, I am extremely pleased and very proud of the people in this system who, again, have come forward to work with us and make it happen and look at all of the possibilities and all of the questions. And I'm sure there are times when some of you get questions. Uh, I'm sure Jeff Thorak is probably is getting driven as much crazy as anyone with all the questions that are coming to him around sports. But it's important that we're doing it and we're doing it right. And we are expending the energy to make sure it is done correctly as we go through the process. And now I'm done. Rebecca has a question. Yeah, Rebecca? <laughs> I can always tell. <laughs> um, just to clarify, the seasonal flu vaccine and should we actually get supplies for this H1N1, that would be voluntary? Yes. No yes, child is going to be required? No, no child is required. Um, and secondly, are we as a district going to be required to outlay any funds ourselves or will everything be purchased um, through other organizations? What I had understood as of last Friday is we had a lot of supplies we were going to have to fund ourselves. And so in, a, in that process, Dr. Safer, who is our school doctor, 
uh, worked with me. We wrote a letter to service providers, doctors and service providers in this area to see if they would donate some funds to help us through that process. But today at uh, Maine Medical Center, I was told that that would not be necessary, that there will be no funds that should come out of the school budget, that everything will be paid for. We do have some funds which we have keyed at this point into the school budget, but which I will turn the bill in to the CDC to be sure it is all covered. So that was my latest as of today at uh, quarter of 11. That was the latest message I had. I'm first to tell you, and I, I think it's fair for me to say, it doesn't mean that quarter of 11 tomorrow the message might change. But that's definitely what I had and what I got in written form today. Thank you, Alan. Does anybody else have any questions? OK. State funding for education update, another one of those moving targets. <laughs> ah, yes, another one of those joyful things. <clears throat> I sent on to all of you the other day a letter from Maine School Management Association. Uh, superintendents met two weeks ago, I think it was, two weeks ago Friday, uh, to talk about where we're going. Uh, they, are, they were fairly clear, not completely clear, but fairly clear, that we are going to face some major cuts in budget for the current 09-10 school year, and definitely in the 10-11 school year. There were no final answers. Uh, we all pushed to say, give us final answers so we know where we're going. We don't have that yet. But what part of that meeting was used to brainstorm some of the ideas of what we may need to do as we see la uh, uh, funds cut. And it talked about a whole mass of issues. Uh, I sent those issues on to you. I am taking them to Cumberland County Superintendents Association near the end of the month. And I do understand that those issues were taken to the Appropriations Committee of the Legislature. I called MSMA today, but they at this point in time did not have any information about what the Appropriations Committee is looking at. But I think the, I think the facts that they are telling us is there is a, still a major loss. There are more losses coming in the next two months. It will cost money for both uh, the Department of Health and Human Services and the school departments. They have estimated we probably would be in about the same cut we had last year, which was about $421,000. If you remember, that one I was able to make up, even though I had to give documentation, I was able to make it up with ARRA money. This coming year, the question is whether there'll be any ARRA money there to do it. And so we will be dealing with that issue as it comes to the forefront. Uh, but it's not, it's not uh, an issue that I'm looking forward to. Uh, I don't think you as a board are going to be looking forward to it because I certainly will have to come back to you with some fairly hard decisions to make as we go through that process. The information they gave us that two weeks ago was it would be at that amount or more as far as what we would lose from what we originally got from state subsidy. And then 10 and 11, uh, we have not even started to touch yet because we lose ARRA money at that point in time. We see greater losses coming. And so we're waiting for the state to give us some indications of where that's going to be. So this is not all good news. Uh, I have to tell you, I, as a superintendent, I'm finding that I am running constantly between H1N1 budget, uh, the president's speech today, and a few other things that have, have, for one reason or another, become major issues. And so we're working with them and trying to stay ahead of them. And I'm, I'm working as hard as I can with Augusta to keep ahead of what's going on. Yeah. Um, Alan, should we be looking at what you did last here at this time, which is to freeze purchases? Uh, that's what I'm looking at right now. I have uh, got the, uh, the information ready uh, to go. I have not done anything. I have to be very honest with you, because I am waiting to see how it's going to play out. I'm also very much aware of the fact that because of my freeze last year, there were losses that were made that I need to, need to do something about. So I'm working on it. But yes, I have, matter of fact, I, I'll say this. Uh, I have an administrator's meeting tomorrow. I'll be talking with them about this. There's a letter on my desk that is ready to go out that talks about freezing budgets until we know exactly what we're going to have to take out. Because a $421,000 cut or greater with the types of budgets we've had recently have got to be reflected in staff. There's no other way I can do that. Thank you. Mary. Um, I know it's an idea that we haven't talked about in a while, but has the state mentioned um, easing up on any of their unfunded mandates? 
I'm going to say this carefully. I'm going to try to word this appropriately. Mm -hmm. they, have, they are doing some of that now. I'm not, I'm not convinced they're doing as much as they need to do. Okay. However, in that list you remember I sent you the other day from Maine School Management, it did talk about the unfunded mandates. Okay. And it did talk about some of the work they're doing to try to change those. Uh, the other piece that goes along with that that is a really important piece for me uh, as a superintendent in particular is the messages that come constantly from the Department of Education about changes. Those have slowed down. They haven't ended, but they have okay. slowed down considerably. And I do know that our senator and the two legislators have been watching that very carefully, particularly because of the way the bills go the senator has to make sure as many of those unfunded mandates are not out there now. Okay. Uh, but you know, I, 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 I can't sit here and honestly say to you they're all gone. I, no, I, I know. can't do that. Okay. Rebecca? <laughs> Uh, I believe last year when the state was about to cut our budgets um, substantially, um, the commissioner, I believe, sat with a group of her administrators and developed an analysis. No, that's police and fire. Um, developed an analysis of unfunded mandates here in the state. Was there ever actually a report issued? your question, Rebecca. Uh, I do remember at the time that I list, but I cannot remember the full features of it, but I will get that and check that out for you. I think it would be really great if um, perhaps the Superintendent's Association would request a copy of that, that analysis. Yep. I'd be more than happy to do Thank that. You. I think to address that, I, uh, I'll use Alan's phrase to use this. I'll do this delicately. And I think Mary was there at that breakfast that we went to that you kindly invited us to. Yeah. She touched, Commissioner Gendron touched upon that, but was rather evasive. And I think if I recall, and if I'm not remembering this, Alan and Mary, please help me, I think she minimized the true cost to districts of what the unfunded mandates were and sort of swept it under the rug a little bit and said, yes, we've developed this list, but didn't view or, or, or articulated that she didn't view that based on their analysis that there were a lot of unfunded mandates. Was that? Right. And I think the way it was explained was that an unfunded mandate is something that the legislature does not put a penny toward. Um, but two thirds of the legislature has to pass these mandates. Um, for them to go to the schools and thereby they are funded but they go through the EPS system which means we get a share or less it. Yeah. of those mandates funded. It, you're, you're right. Is that right? Yeah, you're right. Okay. Yep. But I'll check in. Well and also perhaps the Maine School Management Association could take a closer look at it also. Right. And they're the ones who were working with them closely at the time so I will go back to them. That'd be great. I'm, I was also going to ask, sort of following up on both of those comments, if obviously members of the public are directly impacted by the decisions that are being made. Um, and I would agree with Mary's comment, I mean, in Rebecca's, that I think to chip away at, or even to freeze budgets is not a great long-term strategy because it puts on hold what we're doing. We're beyond that. The state does need to look at some of the requirements, and I'm not advocating any of these, but transportation, I mean, big things that they require us to do, um, you know, have a lot of hidden costs. Does it make sense for members of the public to get in touch with state legislators um, to express concern and sort of prompt or encourage them to take, you know, action? I, I don't know. I tossed that out. Yeah, and we have a uh, tentative date set with um, several of our state legislators, um, which I will, once it's firmed up, I will let the whole school board know. So I would also encourage that if people in the public have suggestions or comments, 
um, to please let us know so we can bring them to the meeting um, to share with them about our, our status and, and our view of what's happening in Maine in education. And I, and I think I have the list either. I'm not going to read the whole list to you, but just to point out a few things that were listed when we were the superintendents the other day, this is, this is public knowledge. Uh, number one was to adopt, and these are not in order of importance. Uh, first one is adopt a statewide teacher contract. Number two, look at a statewide bid for health insurance. Change the 90-day reduction in force notice for teachers to 30 days. Uh, loosen federal restrictions on the use of Title I and special education funds. Take a regional approach to pre-kindergarten. Remove some restrictions on early retirement. Adopt a two-year school budget versus the current annual one, so districts have discretion over two years' worth of funding. State-mandated furloughs for days of school. Simplify the process for closing school. Impose a statewide freeze on all salaries, including superintendents. Look again at uh, cutting back school sports budgets, particularly in transportation, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So those are the types of things that were brought up the other day. Mm -hmm. you, if you want my honest opinion, this list scared the living daylights right out of me. But this is, these are the types of things that were being, were being put on the table that day by uh, superintendents and, uh, from all over the state. Mm -hmm. so. Right. Any other questions or comments, Mary? I would just say that it makes sense to sort of look down the road. And as Alan pointed out, there are, you know, very, very tough days ahead. And so, um, you know, we have to fight this battle from a lot of fronts, many fronts. And, you know, I think looking at the state is really important at this point, those mandates. Um, anybody else? Peter? In regards to state mandates, in the past, for the past two or three decades, the State Department of Education has had enforcement powers if you did not follow state mandates. The way they enforced them is if you didn't do what they told you, they reduce your state aid. They've already done that to us twice. They're going to do it to us two more times this year. They, therefore, have no more enforcement powers. They've already punished us for no reason whatsoever. There's no need for us to be worried about it. They can't cut our state aid anymore. They've already done it. Therefore, they have no enforcement powers. So we have a right now, and we have the power on this side of the table for change to ignore any unnecessary or totally ridiculous state mandates, and therefore use the money in a different place within our education system. We no longer have to be afraid of the big bad wolf because the big bad wolf doesn't have any money. <laughs> You're right. No teeth. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Anybody else before we move on? Okay, Alan, um, just a list of good news tonight. Maine Heritage Foundation lawsuit. You remember uh, last meeting, was it two weeks ago? Uh, I mentioned the Maine Heritage Policy yes. Center's request for information. Uh, I went back to Pauline, and Pauline and I sat down and went over the materials. So what I did was, because I thought it would be interesting for you to see how this all plays out, yeah. we received a letter on February 13th of 2009. It was a letter which we understand uh, we don't have positive proof of this, but we understand we're sent to 12 town managers and 12 superintendents of schools in the state. Cape Elizabeth was one of us. In that request, they asked for data in an electronic format for payroll data for the town and school payroll for calendar years 2006, 2007, 2008. Vendor payments for 2006, 7, and 8, and an electronic copy of all current union contracts. And uh, what we responded very quickly was the fact that the, is, this is the type of information we don't have readily available. It is stored by the people who keep our data. And so that we had to go back to them. There was a cost with that. So from there, you, you can follow the chain of letters and emails back and forth and back and forth on this. Uh, what I found, uh, which was somewhat disheartening, was when we would get fairly close to having a solution, there would be a request for more information than what we were asked in the first time. What became very clear to me was, uh, and if you look on this, you'll see on July 17, 2009, there was a letter from a member of the community of Cape Elizabeth regarding a meeting with uh, MHPC, Maine Heritage F uh, Foundation, and concerns about responses. And this person in the community was saying that the school department and the town were holding back information. We were very clear because we had every piece of data possible to show that we have, were following the process, we would send the data, we would wait for a response, and then we would go the next route along the way. We did receive from them 800 plus dollars to pay for that initial information. 
Uh, there was a letter that went to one of the town, town councilors uh, who also is very active in Maine Municipal who responded at that point in time. Uh, another letter from a uh, person in the public. Uh, there was a letter that uh, was saying uh, that uh, it's from Arnold S. Clark uh, with information, and I, let, I put the letter in here to show you that uh, there was some question about whether there would be a lawsuit against us. The information has finally been completed. It was a slow process. It was not something we were slowing down. It is the availability of the process in order to do that. So currently, Maine Heritage Foundation does have all of the salary information, all the vendor information, and all of this cable is with contracts. Uh, and uh, at this point in time, I have not heard what, how they're using them yet. But they do have that information. I can yeah. always tell which is ready for Rebecca? Mm -hmm. um, well, I just uh, wanted to see whether you interpret and Pauline interpret some of this communication the same way that I do. Um, specifically, mentioned in the email communication from one of the leaders of the anti-tax group Cape for All, they, I believe they're saying this is going to be an annual request. Is that, is that your I'm understanding? Yes. That's what I'm understanding. shaking your ideas too. And mm. how much of this time did it require for a view of you, Pauline? 30 hours. And was that included in the $853? No. They would only pay for the information itself but it was over 30 hours. And does the um, Freedom of Information Act allow for reimbursement for staff hours that is put toward the gathering of data? If this is going to be a yearly request, I suggest that perhaps you think about including that in the uh, reimbursement. And you will see chats in here as they added more and more information that they wanted at that point in time. Can you define what minimum charges Minimum charge? What is minimum charge for, um, for employee time? I'm thinking it's $10 per hour that we can charge. $10 now? No. And is there a number of hours that we're capped at? Anybody else? Yeah, I guess I would like to comment that I hope as a community going forward, especially during difficult times, that um, we be sensitive to the amount of time um, and the, requ the, the requests that are already being placed upon administrators, business managers, teachers who I would consider very competent um, and already doing their jobs that we don't go down the path of filing lawsuits so that our town becomes absorbed in um, a very negative way where we should be spending our time, energy, resources, really trying to do the business of what schools do around curriculum and other more important matters. So it concerns me primarily for that reason. Um, you all already have enough on your plate, and I think you're already doing a very good job managing the system. Thank you. Yes, so, Alan, I'm you know me, I want to get to the bottom line. Have they filed a lawsuit against us? No. The, uh, the document is in here. I think it's uh, uh, the very next document after the timeline talks about it. But from that point on, we did manage to get everything back and forth so that at this point in time, there is not uh, a lawsuit pending. Uh, the person from town who wrote back and forth to them uh, commented on the fact that uh, he, was, he was looking at that for a lawsuit based on him. Heresy. Heresy. Yeah. Heresy. Heresy. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> all have had a long day. And this is that member of Cape for All? Yes. The... Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But at this point in time, no lawsuit. Okay. And have you communicated with the, sc the school's attorney about yes. this? Okay. Yes. Okay. Because yes. I assume that if, yeah. if this goes further, yeah. that we will just turn it over to them and let them deal with it. We, we, as a matter of fact, we communicated with the school's attorney. I just have to look at the first date here. Uh, February 13th, we got the request. I, within three days of that, I was on the phone with the school's attorney. Okay. Because at that point in time, they didn't know anything about this. Right. Uh, and so we were the first school to report it. Then they began to get other reports. And so mm -hmm. at that point in time, we began to hear, I don't have facts to prove that, mm -hmm. that there were 12 systems that were selected to be a part of this. Because I, I agree uh, with what Karen's saying with just an additional twist, is this is not worth mm -hmm. your time 
for your staff's time and effort. Yeah. Um, Particularly it, during budget season, right. which is when right. all of your, this your came time down. Is best spent with the things that you need to do. So, um, you know, you've done a wonderful job. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have been so charitable. <laughs> Thank you, Alan. Anybody else? Okay. Um, are you sure? <laughs> well, the Hannaford Field concession shed is. Are, are you going to do that, Jeff? You're not ready to do that? Okay. So I am back on time. Resignation, Alan? Yes. Uh, bear with me for just a moment. I have a resignation from Tim Cross. Uh, he wrote to us uh, on September 1st, so as we were opening school to let us know that he had accepted a full-time position and would be leaving, so his last day was Friday, will be Friday, September 18th. Uh, so that is an EdTech, okay, I have to check to be sure, an EdTech 3 position, which will be, we will be filling? Yes. Okay. And this is just informational. Question? Yes. Um, it reminded me when I read that, that um, I know that our, our employees usually go with the school year. Mm -hmm. Um, and they sign contracts with us. These people don't sign contracts. These do not. Okay. ones, twos, and threes don't sign contracts. Okay, so it's teachers Work agreements. and others. Uh, administrators. Well, administrators. Yeah. Yeah. Who sign contracts. So you won't get my letter tomorrow. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> not <laughs> funny, Alan. <laughs> yeah. Um, do I'm trying. We, do we have a policy or a procedure when an employee leaves that um, they customarily give? Two week notice. Yep. And that's what this is. Uh, right. Came on the first and is giving us the two yep. weeks. Okay. okay. Just, it just, I wondered about yep. that. Thanks. Um, instructional support update. And I'm going to preface that while Dom is coming up. I have talked with a couple of three of you about this. I know you received an enormous amount of information, which I thank Dom for because I think it was important that you get it. But what Dom is going to do today is to simplify this so you will understand because the biggest question was the, the people we use in our programs, how the numbers have increased or decreased, and how we've spent money in order to do that. So Dom, I think, is going to take the first page of this report, which says memorandum and kind of Okay, uh, help us from there. I'll try to answer the questions. I mean, it's very simple. Please. I know there's a lot of questions around ed techs and how many ed techs and where are they going. And um, I know some of you have done a lot of tours in the building. Um, I have met with each of the staff. I just want to put this out there. Each of my staff meetings, I finally get around to Palm Cove Middle School and High School. I meet with them weekly. I did talk about your concerns, and they did want me to bring back their voice as well. They would love to have you guys volunteer at any of their programs anytime. So if you want to go through any of these programs and their teachers are listed, they would love to see you there. I know some of you volunteer at some of the other programs, so that would be something I'd throw out to you guys. So one of the first things I, I just want to tell you, I know there was a lot of questions about how many students we have in special ed. I know right now we have uh, 1,709 students in the district. Um, and if you divide 175 students in that, we're right at 10%. We're at 10% last year, 10% the year before, 10%. So we're kind of staying right in that ballpark. Um, our numbers are not dropping. Um, and this is really hard. To, I don't know how, and I know in the back of the, if you look at the back of the uh, page before, that really gives the different exceptionalities. We have 13 different disabilities in special ed. And again, there is a clear shift. There is definitely more students with multiple disabilities, autism, um, and emotional disabilities in that category and shifted over. So I think those kids, we have very high needs in the district. So when we talk about 174 special needs students, they're not the real, the typical, when I first came here, I think there's a lot of students with learning disabilities, speech and language, that has shifted a little bit. I think that the population has changed. I think a lot of kids coming in from child development services, which is CDS, which are kids zero to five, they already have disabilities, they're coming into the public schools, and um, I'm, I know I've talked with Falmouth and Cumberland, we, we're all seeing um, more kids with disabilities. So I just want to put that out there. I know I keep saying that, but um, I think it'd be great. And this year, which is on the second, um, I think still on the first, well, third bullet, our CDS population has dramatically increased. We had 17 students. Out of those 17 students, seven have significant needs. Um, so. 
when we did get the application for the ARRA grant. Okay, this is the, this is the stimulus money grant. Um, we had to look at it, um, and I had to do it the same. I did this grant, which is a $210,000 grant that I put in your box. I know it, it's very grant-esque, but um, what I had to do is I was going to, we looked at this CDS population, and we needed 3.5 ed techs at Pong Cove to support these kids. They needed ABA programming, which is applied behavioral analysis. I'm not trying to be too worried, but they really need really one-on-one -on -one status. So what we did was we had to write the grant. We added 3.5 positions in there to support Palm Cove. Um, so that's where the ed techs are. From the, yes. Okay, I'm getting lost already. Okay. I'm sorry. This is really hard. To, sorry. I'm sorry. Um, that came from the federal stimulus money. So that's is that right, Tom? It, this is really confusing. Okay. okay. I'm just trying to get a right. grasp on it's what's disappearing I, in 18 I, months. Right. It is going to be disappearing, but it, it's really not out of the stimulus grant money because I could not put paraprofessionals in that. Okay. I started out writing the grant that way. It was denied three to four times. Okay. I had to rewrite the grant four times. What the department told me then was for your federal money that you get, the which we call local entitlement, every year I get 365000 this is the local federal money that comes in okay. from to the state to us. I had to put it in that grant because the department said, do not put paraprofessionals in the stimulus money grant. Okay. So it's, it's, it's hard. So I had to do two of these grants at the same time and get okayed by Tom Colon, who runs the, our financial department at the department. So, so they're, in, they're in still in federal money, but they're in this grant the local entitlement grant, which I did give you as well. So that's how it's broken out. Please define paraprofessional. Paraprofessional is ed techs. So when we're talking ed techs, I try to use it. I think ed techs, to ed techs, ed techs is a slang language. So I like to use paraprofessionals. So I'm trying to, again, like someone like instructional support, try to use the same language. So we had 27.5 paraprofessionals last year. We have 33 now. So that's where I know you guys had a lot of questions. Well, well, why do we have all these ed techs? So what I tried to do, and I know I could not condense it into one little page to show you because I think what I thought I heard was that people wanted to know why we need all these ed techs. So each of these programs have, you know, I numbered the students out. I'm not going to go through each one. I think you guys can read. But you, some people wanted to know where the ed techs are paid out of federal money. So I put it right in dark ink paid under local entitlement. So you can see on paraprofessionals. So this is Sonia's Choices Program at Pond Cove. She has nine students. Those are the direct instruction hours that we have to provide by law through an IEP, which is an individual educational program. So what I did was I broke out each program. Choices, again, is a cognitive behavioral program that we have several students in here. So these kids are not just in a classroom being taught by Sonia. These are throughout K through four. They're, through, they're in the kindergarten, they're in first grade, second grade, but these are the nine students that have been assigned to a program. Her max is 11. So I just want to, I, I'm just going to slowly go through this if you guys have any questions. I know one, when you want to know where, who, who's being paid out of federal money. So Ron, Rhonda is paid out of federal money on this page. If you flip the same page, Dave Croft, he's the functional life skills teacher there. And you can see he's also got, uh, he's 10 students. And here is the ed text over here, and that's the direct instruction amount. I, try, I just numbered the students to protect for, obviously, because it's now a public document. And you flip the page of Silicon Cove, and there's the resource room teachers, and it just talks about where people are. And um, both Susan Pillsbury, K through three, and Tom Robinson, I put the resource room numbers in there because there are a couple ed techs with one-on-one -on -one students but they're fully mainstreamed, typically. They're not in the functional life program or Pond Cove. So that's just Pond Cove, and it goes to the middle school and then to the high school. So you've added most of the paraprofessionals at Pond Cove because Correct. of the significant needs of the kids that have entered the system. Correct. Part of that, based on what the road you're going down or leading yep. us down, some of that is, or can you just clarify, Assuming those students K stay in our system, K-12, yeah. the money that is, uh, there's some federal monies that are tied to those students, but it's not the 
um, stimulus money grants. It's regular local entitlement federal money. So that money isn't going to go away in 18 months with some of these other programs like the literacy program that we've set up. It will go away. In, 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 in another couple of years, the $210,000 will go away. And I'm gonna, we're going to have to look at can we absorb, if you want to say, go That's back to those 27.5 ed techs, I'll either, I'll have to come to you and say, I need these ed techs. Or and you're going to say no, and then I'll I, have to absorb it. I think that's a. I think that's what some of we were asking. That's a very. That's a very important point. Mm -hmm. to, to know that if these students stay here, this percent, this yep. portion, is part of the stimulus money, which goes away in two years or yep. 18 months. Yet, if these students are still here, yep. then the district has to absorb even more of the instructional support monies than we've had to in the past? Well, we have to support the students that have IEPs that are telling us that we have to, we have to support them. They're, again, they're But we had an extra boost. I mean, we've been, been supporting our instructional support student population prior to the stimulus money. The stimulus money gave a little bit of an injection to... It saved us, actually. If we did not have the stimulus money, I would be coming to you for five positions and, and ask for in this budget in order to help us through. And just to be clear, I think for the public to know, and I think we stated this throughout the budget process, the instructional support programs are primarily federally mandated, yet they're not completely federally funded, even with the stimulus money. So most of the, I think we at some point came up with a rough estimate that about 70% of those costs are borne by the local taxpayers. And that's irregardless of which and stimulus money or not. That is an unfunded mandate that has been around for quite a while. So we, we have to pay, and, and, and I mean, the, the costs, if you read any of the special ed stuff out there, I mean, the kids that are coming through are, that some are really needed, very, very expensive. We have to educate them. That's our ability. So. Dominic, you need to help me understand. Okay. You said that the paraprofessionals were not accepted into the stimulus um, funding grant requests. No, that no, they, are, are grant. they were not required. They yep. were not accepted under that. Yep. That the new paraprofessionals that you hired for the incoming students into kindergarten yep. were through the regular. To, uh, local um, entitlement. The federal money, the other right. local entitlement application. So I don't understand how then yep. that those paraprofessionals funding will disappear in 18 months if it is not yep. funded through it, the stimulus money. It, well, it, it, we could keep it in there. Again, when I do the contract, I'm either going to have to um, cut the entire supplies and what I did was I moved supplies, equipment, and staff development to the ARA funds, because that was acceptable under DOE standards. So that's why it, it, I gave you guys the applications. Yeah. I know they're very confusing, but I had to swap over things in order to follow the rules that I, I was told. And I had to redo both applications several times. OK, so in 18 months, the funding for your supplies per professional, um, supplies professional development, yada, yada, will, yeah. will disappear. Yeah. It, unless we get more money, which I don't know. I mean, who knows with everything. But yes, I'll have to relook at that application to do that. I, and I think you, you made a point a minute ago, and I just want to come back to that point for just a minute, is that we always need to be very careful under special ed law that a child who enters special ed, let's say as a kindergartner, doesn't necessarily end up as a special ed student in grade 12. Our job is to try to give them the skills in order for them to move in a different direction. And so our hope is, and I think that was your conversation with me in the beginning, is as we looked at these young people coming in in kindergarten, tried to provide a full day program for them, we're hoping that through that process over the next two or three years, we can get them to a point Correct. where they are yep. fairly or completely independent. And we did some good things with the stimulus money too. We have the literacy position with Susan Hamilton to really work on literacy. Um, and we did, I mean, but, but again, I had to do a lot of the ed techs just because the variables that came in with CDS population. So, yeah. When I go through the um, staffing that you put forward, I only count three. Is it 10? Or how many? I only count three per, um, professionals listed as paid under local entitlement. Yes. There are three there under local entitlement, but what we did was we had some considering savings in the regular budget right now, and that's 
when we worked with um, Pauline, we went through the through there, and, and that's what we, we so had to Didn't we work just with. hire three? N no. We, see, that, the problem is we have, we have people quitting all the time, and so we had 33 positions. And again, what I sent to you in May, there, like five or six of those people are gone now. They just left or they got new positions or so forth. So what we have to do is replace them in order to go back in. So that's, these are where they are, right along the side here. Didn't we increase the number of paraprofessionals by three and a half because of the um, stimulus money? Yes. Weren't there not other paraprofessionals funded by local entitlement before we had the stimulus money? Mm -hmm. There were, again, but not, not last year, list? not last year, the year before they were under the local entitlement. The reason why we don't want to do that, we don't want to pay paraprofessionals under there because we have to pay like almost exactly. six or seven thousand extra dollars and the grant money's kind of eaten up. So that's why we don't want to do that. We would rather do contracted people underneath that. So. so when we put them under federal money, the issue with the federal money is we also have to pay them federal retirement. And so that costs us more. So that's why we try to keep them in the regular ed budget. I feel like I'm going down the rabbit hole again. But, you are. Um, <laughs> well, Rebecca, I'm I, with you. I would recommend highly to come in my office. I will sit down and go right through line by line by line. I can try to explain to you how things go over. Because if you don't look at the grants and understand, it's, it's very confusing. So. Yes, I know. Can I, so, so based on the 33 and the 27 and a half, yes. net net, we hired five and a half Correct. new paraprofessionals, yep. two and a half of which, however you pots you put it in, are somewhat funded through the stimulus money. Three full. Okay, three, three full. full. So, and we don't know where we're going to be in two years in terms of whether or not, I mean, the, the population of the needs for the paraprofessionals are dependent on the needs of the students, so maybe we won't need those three people when the Absolutely. stimulus money goes away. And, and that's the whole thing. In the, vertical department, everything shifts around. I mean, we're constantly moving people because of skills. Like I gave you in your last packet, what are people's strengths, what are people's weaknesses, and we kind of move people around based on who we've hired. So we're, we're still retaining a lot of our really great paraprofessionals. So, so other people are leaving for you know, other types of jobs. So. Kathy, <laughs> assuming we understand this, um, down the road, we lose money, so we lose staff, and the staffing drops below what you feel we can do, what we should be doing for these kids, what we need to do. Um, what happens? When you tell me that I can't, when I say I, I need these amount right. of tax, and we say based on I don't IPs, have the money, you say you can't. Mm -hmm. um, I think Pam Vost said it the best the other day. She said we're going to be in court, and um, and like today, Alan was in a very very difficult meeting with me, and um, you can you can see it. I mean, I'm so anyway. I, I think that's the best way to stop it. I mean, I'm we're I have two complaints, a due process, and some other things going on. So it's it's a constant um, balancing it. Balancing it, yeah. And to, because we're tr the reality is we're trying to keep we're trying to develop really good programs, keep the students within Cape Elizabeth, not send them off to some of these other programs. I'm not going to name them. I think they get a great education here. Um, and I think most of the parents, I would say 95% of our parents, are very pleased with the program. Well, and wasn't the reason you brought a lot of this in-house was because it was, one, less expensive to the district, and two, you felt you could do a better job, as I yeah. recall, a couple of years yeah. ago? Okay. Definitely. But I, th I think Dom's point, again, we need to keep, make that, is that federal law has requirements around identified students that it doesn't have for regular ed students. Mm -hmm. and so. Pam was right in her statement, and I certainly saw a little of that today, is that you put yourself in line for a lawsuit, and a lawsuit which can be extremely expensive. And so what we, what we know very clearly, I have a long history with special ed from my past experience, is we have to have word every document correctly, to word every IEP correctly, we have to have everything in place and correctly done. And it is constant. Dom spends an inordinate amount of time just taking a look at documents to be sure we have everything in place. And what Dom suddenly finds, as I do, then somebody else writes a letter that is seen as a letter from Dom that gives instructions, and it isn't appropriate instructions, but immediately you're caught in the crossfire with that. 
I don't, I think I'm pretty accurate yeah, on that. Absolutely. Dom, can yeah. you remind um, us and particularly anyone who might be watching what the cost is for outsourcing versus providing these services yeah. within the district? Yeah, and, and again, I think, and, and I have, first of all, I have the greatest staff. These choices of functional life skill program teachers and mm -hmm. ed techs, they work really, really hard. We brought our other district placement uh, back in from last year that was over $100,000 just for one student from back into the district, into the middle school, which was absorbed. So the positive thing is, I know you're looking at numbers, but we absorbed that student within the middle school and did not hire any new staff. Mm -hmm. So at the Pong Cove, because of that CDS population, we needed new staff. Mm -hmm. And I, I can't tell you enough, again, Pong Cove invites you guys down there, come in, sit in, watch what's going on. Um, I think that they would love to have you in, so. And outside placement, really, is different for every one of them based on whether they are full-time students there who live there 24 hours a day right. as opposed to students who go for part of the day or what. But you're, normally your bottom line, if yeah. I'm not mistaken, is about $50,000. Right. Your it top line can yeah. go well over $100,000. Not saying that we're not getting challenged for, for people that want, us, that want to send their kids outside of the district too. That's another whole issue. Anyone else have questions or comments for Dom? I would just say one last thing. Uh, <laughs> Dom and I talked the other day, you know, trying to make this as simple as possible. But to be honest with you, it isn't as simple as possible. And Dom and I have had these conversations, as have Pauline and Dom and I, trying to sort this out. And it is. It's, it's, a, it's very difficult because changes can happen, like this most recent resignation, yep. can happen overnight. You know, we think we're all set, we're ready to go, we're moving ahead, no problems. And it changes very quickly. And I think part of it is because our educational technicians, a majority of them are highly educated, many of them with master's degrees. You don't find that in many systems, but we have bachelor's and master's degrees. And so they will work with us as long as they can, and if something else comes along, I don't blame them. They look for that next, next level of work. Thank you very much for all of the documentation and the information you provided us, Dom. Um, last quick item in communications, I just wanted to publicly thank the school board's human resource committee and all my fellow board members for taking the time to um, do the school board self-evaluation at our last, uh, in executive session at our last business meeting. I, I found it helpful. I think it was a nice opportunity for us to talk and we can always um, learn from that, so I want to thank everyone for taking the time to do that. Moving on to new business, I'm going to ask Alan, if you would, since Mr. Perry has been sitting here so patiently, if we could just switch the order and um, let him come and present his request for the French exchange trip. Thank you very much. My name is David Perry. I'm a French teacher at the high school, and I'm here to make a request for a your authorization to organize an exchange trip to a high school in France in Saint Nazaire, which is on the uh, western coast of, the coast of France, at the mouth of the Loire River on the Atlantic Ocean, a town that's very similar to Portland and the surrounding area. Uh, this is a true exchange. Uh, we have a high school that we've had a contact with for close to 10 years. We've had three exchanges with them over the past 10 years. Um, we go there for a little over two weeks live in families, see what life is like, and they come and visit us and live with our families and see what life is like. It's a wonderful experience, uh, and the evaluations I've done over the past 10 years, with, to a person, they've valued the experience tremendously. I've received letters from parents saying, thank you very much, I have one family where two of their children have participated in this. This has been one of the highlights of their, of their high school career. Um, it's more than just walking down the Champs-Elysees and looking in shop windows. It's more than sitting in a cafe and ordering a croque monsieur. Um, I liken it to a linguistic chihuahua. Um, there are some very difficult moments. There are moments where the, the child is there in their new home thinking, why am I here? What did I sign up for? What have I gotten myself into? Um, it is very, very challenging, 24 hours a day. These young people living in a family they've never met before, in a country they've studied, but now they're seeing it up close, warts, warts and all. Um, 
gaining a new perspective where they thought they knew everything and suddenly they find out they're in a situation where they don't know everything. Um, it's, it's a very challenging experience. They learn a lot of language. Their French improves tremendously. They learn a lot about themselves. They learn some very important personal coping skills. Um, and of course, they, they, they learn not only how to be wonderful guests, but how to be gracious hosts, because there is reciprocity. You take care of someone for two weeks, and they're taking care of you for two weeks. And whenever you do something like that, it's never any exchange. And so sometimes you get treated like a king, and maybe you, you do your best, but you just don't do as wonderful job as was done for you. Or maybe you treat someone like a queen, and it just doesn't equal out the same way. But it's, it's one of those life lessons you learn, that you participate in this, you go in this experience, and you learn more than just the latest local slang or what the popular music is in France. Um, it's a wonderful experience. It takes a lot of time on everyone's parts, on host family parts, on the students' part, because they will be missing possibly six or seven days of school, so there's work to be made up. Um, it takes a tremendous amount of my time, um, but it's a wonderful experience for what the students get out of it. And when I see what they've gotten out of it, that invigorates me to try it again. So here I am again, hoping to pull this off. Um, I have talked about it with students in the school. I did have a parent meeting in June, and I think I might have 10 or 11 families that are interested. If you give me your approval tonight, then I'll have another parent meeting next week and try and get some real interest by collecting some checks. And then with your hopeful, hopefully you're giving me your approval in October, then um, I would go ahead and collect the balance of payment and get everything moving. Um, the French school is looking forward to organizing something with us this year and seeing what we can do. The dates that you have on the back, you have a handout, don't you? Mm -hmm. um, the dates on the back of the handout, unless something really unusual happens, are pretty much in stone that we will travel in February and we will host in April. Um, and this is because of where their vacation falls as opposed to where our vacations fall. And if we were to go in April, we would run into the problem that we had two years ago is that we were there during a period where they were not in school. And for us to not be in school would require us getting back two days before the AP stats exam, which probably wouldn't be a good thing for anyone who's taking AP stats to be jet lagged walking into that. So um, we will go in February, um, quite early in February. Uh, I projected the 4th through the 20th, which will uh, put us there during the week of their school time and a week of their vacation time. The first week would be during when they're in school and our second week there they would be on vacation. And then they would be coming back. Their, their holiday in April is from between the 10th and the 26th. So I'm thinking anywhere, anywhere between the 6th and the 28th they could be coming for a little more than 15 days. Um, the group we worked with in the past, Come Tour, provides health insurance. Uh, provides cancellation insurance. Um, they're very, very well organized. Uh, the two escorts that we've used in the past were outstanding. Uh, they went the extra mile to make sure everything worked exactly, exactly as it was supposed to for us. Um, it, is, it is wonderful to be able, when we're in Paris visiting for a few days, to have that escort available should something go wrong. Nothing went wrong the last time we were there, but when I was there six years ago, one of the students got sick. We had just gotten on a bus tour and he fell ill. Well, it's time to go back to the hotel. So I took him and we went back to the hotel. And the guide took the students for the rest of the day. If there's no guide, we all go back to the hotel. I make sure the student's not well, is, is secure and safe and comfortable. And then I talk to everybody and say, okay, this is your perimeter. We're not doing what we're going to do today. You stay within this, these boundaries and check back with me in a few hours and see how you're doing. 
So having that extra adult there in the in the form of this this escort provided by Pome Tour is um, a great help to all of us. So I'm um, ready to answer any of the questions. So, go ahead, Kathy. Um, you're saying the duration is approximately 17 days, and I'm wondering um, what the magic is in a 17-day trip versus, say, 9, 10, 11-day trip where you wouldn't miss necessarily as much school. It's, it's probably around the 12 and 14 day that you get much shorter than that and you're not there a long time. You need to be there for a certain amount of time to get over the jet lag, to get over the flood of language that's coming at you. And it takes about seven days to really start to catch up. The first week, even students who are very good understand very little. They think they've, been, they, they think they've never learned any French. And it's just gone. Um, then the second week, they start to understand things, and language starts to emerge. Um, ideally, uh, we would go for closer to 20 to 21 days, because it's, it's after the third week period that all the barriers start to fall, and language starts to come on really strongly in many, many students. But that's, that's a long time to be gone. I did that my first trip nine years ago, and that was just a long time to be gone from school. That was very difficult. So I, I cut it back to a time where um, I think they can still, the, the, the cost benefit kind of breaks even of, of what we're losing from school as opposed to what we're gaining linguistically. Thank you. Anybody else? I just want to comment that um, personally, I wouldn't have approved this trip if you weren't having the kids be in the school. Um, that makes a huge difference, having had some personal experience with it. It was a great experience, and actually such that we hosted our exchange student this summer for several weeks, and it was, and I will attest to the time, it takes a lot of time to build, and I think it was an amazing experience in terms of developing French-speaking capabilities, but that was one problem, I thought, with that trip, and I probably would not have approved it. I, I'm in support of it, and I'm thrilled to see, particularly the first week, because that's when you're developing and establishing relationships, and I think that's absolutely critical. So I applaud you for doing that, and I think that will make a huge difference. That's, talk about take, making mistakes and learning from them. Well, mm -hmm. that's what I found out in the last trip. And we all survived. That but was, <laughs> but that, that, was, that was important that we have some school time. Aside from the cultural gain of, of going to school and seeing what classes are like, and seeing what French students are like, um, meeting a wider group of, of individuals, um, I gained a better understanding of, of what the importance of school time was. Karen. And I just wanted to say that I appreciate and agree with your assessment of the time that is needed to really begin to have some language acquisition take place and the comfort level and everything else. But I also just wanted to thank you for actually doing this program and providing it as an opportunity for our kids. My children don't take French, but um, I'm sure many of your French students do benefit from it greatly. So thank you for all the time. I'm sure that well, there is there is the, the spillover that even those who don't participate in the trip, when the students are here, um, the French students can go to the other schools. Um, when we did this two years ago, the French students went to the middle school one day towards the end and they were leaving the next day and they were clamoring for them to come back. Yeah. So we had an exchange with Costa Rica that year too. So they worked in two days for the Costa Rican students to go to the middle school and visit because they were just so popular and they wanted to talk with them and do different activities with them. Um, so they, they do get out to the other classes and, and other students are able to benefit from their, their presence in the schools. Any other questions? Um, is there a motion to approve the trip, or does anyone have a motion? I move that we approve the 2009-2010 French exchange trip as proposed by um, Mr. Perry. Thank you, Rebecca. Is there a second? A second. Thank you, Mary. Any questions or comments? All those in favor? Six zero. Thank you very much. Thank I will you. be meeting with parents next week and seeing if we have a group. And if we have a group, um, then I'll be back in October for your second approval. This is you don't need to. You need to you're we, you're you good to go. This, you don't need a comment period or a reflection period. I'm good to go. 
Thank you very much. <laughs> Staff Agnes. Thank you very much, David. Um, okay, moving back. The cro girls' cross country trip to Rhode Island. We have a girls' cross country trip. Uh, Miriam Doss has sent this in. Uh, Jeff, would you like to speak to this briefly? And I should add, while you're up there, you just sent to me today one for uh, David Weatherby as well. So if you want to speak about that. Sure. Really? The girls' cross country trip to Rhode Island was a trip that we took last year um, and that the girls competed in a pretty high level competition with um, some other public uh, schools uh, across New England. And um, it's a great experience for, for the girls. This trip um, would be funded by the girls' cross country boosters and some of the funds that they raised during the uh, Beach to Beacon. Um, sales as well. So the plan is to depart at 10 a.m. from Cape Elizabeth High School, um, compete, and that would be on September 25th, compete Saturday the 26th, and return directly after that meet back to Cape Elizabeth. Um, and they would be chartering uh, transportation to that as well. So since that is an overnight trip, I, mean, I have to bring that to you for permission. The second trip is not an overnight trip, so it's just new. And the only, I think, part of the reason for the depart time at um, during the school day is to get the students down there at a reasonable hour, instead of leaving directly after school and, and then having to have it stop, have dinner, um, check into their hotel, and then a, a, a length, lengthy day, and then more difficult to compete the next day. So it's um, obviously we would have. Communication with the students and the faculty uh, for any time that would be missed and making sure that homework was in and exams or quizzes or anything like that would be done beforehand. Thank you. Is there a motion or a question? I move, I move that we approve the high um, sorry, the girls cross country trip to Rhode Island Invitational. Thank you, Rebecca. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Karen. Any questions or comments on the trip? Doesn't this need uh, Jeff's signature? Yeah. Mr. Shedd, I think we needed your signature on this form. Do we have your, what is it, what is the power of attorney to <laughs> sign it on now? Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? All those in favor? Six zero. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, and then um, the on September 25th as well, the boys. I just received, and I just received this from David um, this morning or this afternoon. And the boys' country, cross country team will be would like to travel to uh, Manchester, New Hampshire, and that's leaving on a Saturday um, and returning on a Saturday. But they would be leaving um, the state. So um, that. 14 students would be participating in that event. That's something that we've done annually for um, quite a long time. Um, so I, I wanted to make sure that you were informed of that. Um, I had David fill out the uh, field trip request form just to make sure. And then rushing over here after the game, I left it on my desk because I was supposed to give a copy to Mr. Hawkins. So um, I do have a completed form um, that David did uh, fill out this afternoon, but I apologize for not bringing that with me. And my understanding of this, where it isn't an overnight trip, and it's within 100 and some odd miles, it's one that I can approve, but just for your information, so you'll know what is going on. Is that, the, on is that the same course where the New England were run last year? In Manchester? Correct. So that's a great experience for the kids to have that. Especially if they're competing in New England. So. Thank you, Jeff. Um, okay, so we don't need to do anything on that. No. Anything else? Thank you very much. You. Okay, consideration to approve high school co-curricular fee positions. We have a fairly long list. I don't know if you want me to read it all or if there are specific questions you'd like to do, but I do have a page of two others that were sent over today, the data today. But if we can get them done tonight, I would like to just get all of them done at once. And the two new ones, the Literary Magazine and Gay Straight Alliance. 
Um, so how do you guys feel about, do you want him to read every single one of these or can we do them as a, um, what's the sentiment? Uh, do not read every single one of them, please. <laughs> you have several pages. Yeah. Are you doing it by school, or are you just going to do it? I think all of these uh, are high school. school. High school. Okay. And then I do have uh, one yes. from middle school. That's a very short. Also, it is high school. Well, I'll move it so we can have any discussion. Okay. I move that we approve the high school co curricular fee positions as presented by the superintendent. Thank you, Rebecca. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Karen. Okay, questions or comments on any of the information in this packet? I, I just have a question. I don't know if this would be for Jeff or for Alan, but um, I see a lot of department chairs now splitting jobs, and I don't know if this is something that's pretty typical and if there's a very clear job description so that that's an easy thing to do or just why that occurs, the sharing of the department chair job. Maybe I think the only department chair position is what is now. It's art. 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 art as well. Okay, art is a unique situation um, in that um, one of our longtime teachers in art is only works for the second semester. Okay. That's Mary Hart. Um, and so she and Richard Roethlisberger split that position. That's happened quite a few times. And that's sort of unique to that position. Um, math. Um, I'm tempted to say it took two people to try to fill a Wayne Brownell shoes, but it was really, <laughs> it was really um, trying to find this, use the strengths of both people. Um, and it, I would say it's worked well in that case. It's something I think hard about um, before I do it, because it's not my most preferred method, but I think in some cases it can work pretty well, and I think it has a map. SAC also has shared? Yes, uh, Dr. Gret and Ms. LaPointe um, have been doing that for the last couple of years. Okay. SAC is student is the student government. Um, that's what that is. There are some others that are, have, that are shared outside of the department chair, for example, math team. Um, Chris, Chris, Ms. Chris Hayward is the main um, advisor to the math team, um, but because he's a baseball coach in the spring, Chris Newell, who's one of the math teachers, gives him some significant assistance in the spring for the math meets that are taking place in the spring. Um, all of those positions where the divided things are not, don't result in any cost increases. It's just a matter of dividing the stipends that already existed um, into parts. Um, book talk. Um, is another one that's divided between um, Mrs. Bell, our librarian, and Ms. Tripp, who's one of our foreign language teachers. Um, there's a couple of others as well. Uh, natural helpers. Um, the reason for natural helpers is because it's really, because those involve retreats by students, it's very helpful to have, well, very helpful to have two voices, obviously, but it's also very helpful to have uh, a, a male and a female, and that's sort of been the tradition for a while. Um, with that. And I, think I think that's all of them that are split. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? I, I just have a clarifying question. What does SST stand for? SST is the student support, support team. team. It's the team that exists in each one of the schools okay. uh, to consider the needs of kids who may need plans for support outside okay. of special ed. Uh, or to screen students to try to sort of super coordinate the uh, attempts by teachers to do things within their regular classrooms um, um, to either screen to special ed or to avoid the necessity of um, special education. And can I just ask a quick question um, f for um, the person, is it the theater position in the high school a part-time job? Yes, it is a half-time position. Okay. Thank you. Yes. The teaching position. Teaching part of yes. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Okay. All those in favor of the motion on the table? Six nothing. Thank you, Jeff and Alan. Um, okay. Middle school athletic fee positions. And there were two of those. I have two said. middle school athletic positions. The first one is Sarah McClement. The second one is Maureen Cahill. 
and a summary of their, they are both new hires, but not new positions. And there is a summary at the bottom of their past experience. I move that we approve the middle school athletic fee positions as uh, proposed by the superintendent. Thank you, Rebecca. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mary. Any questions or comments? All right, this is a question for um, Jeff. With the middle school um, coaches, I, I know you notice you said they have uh, soccer playing experience or field hockey playing experience. It will be a great addition. As far as new um, coaches coming to the system in middle school, can you, can you just describe how they might be mentored, supported, developed um, if they don't have a strong background necessarily in the sport? And I'm not, a, I'm not saying or implying because I don't know enough about these individuals if they do or don't, but just how the system provides them the support they need to be successful um, in their coaching positions. Um, well, there, we have a few opportunities um, with all of our coaching staff, middle school or high school. Um, something as a result of our Sports Done Right piece, we are now able to um, give our coaches access to the coaching online course that's required by the Maine Principals Association. And in the past, because that was paid for um, by the school or funded by individual schools, and it was fairly expensive, um, we didn't we offer that uh, opportunity to middle school coaches. That was strictly just, it was a requirement by the Maine Principals Association for high school students, uh, or for high school coaches and um, now we can offer that to uh, middle school coaches as well and uh, no expense no um, expense to the school um, so they just register online now and take that so there's opportunity for them to take our coaching certification course um, there's also opportunity for um, varsity coaches to um, work with our youth coaches all the way up through middle level sub varsity and varsity um, and also, I think Scott Labby in the middle school is a great um, person for our coaching staff to, especially we're fortunate to have so many middle school faculty that are coaches right now. Um, so Scott has constant communication with them as far as how things are going and, um, and uh, any concerns or, or positive feedback to, that he's able to provide them. So. And just um, as far as the opportunities are concerned, I mean, are they, it sounds as though they're optional and not required. Um, is, that, is that the case? Middle level athletics, there's, yeah, there's not a, a required, as far as a certified coaching course. Okay. At the high school level, there is. But okay. it's a recommendation by the Maine Principal Association. And I know that you've been working a lot, and I know you're doing some really exciting things around development and support and everything. So thank you for answering that. And I know that the middle school is a tricky, a tricky place for the coaching position. So um, I was, I was just curious. Yeah, no, and I, like I said, mentioned it's, uh, it's really a, when you can have faculty coaches, um, the benefits are just you know tremendous as far as getting to know the students in different ways, communication um, from administrators to coaches or from uh, student to coaches it just improves immensely so when we can have faculty coaching I think it really is a is a positive experience for, for our kids so, thank, you. thank you Jeff any other questions or comments all those in favor six zero um, okay consideration to approve the replacement of the Robert B Lund intermediate Elementary school commemorative plaque. Alan? Yes. Uh, I think in fact when Kathy was the chair, we got the first letter from Robert Bulon Jr., I think he is. Uh, a school here on the campus of the campus, uh, the name was changed to the Robert B. Lund Intermediate Elementary School in 1963. At that point in time, there supposedly was a plaque. We have searched everywhere under the sun to find that plaque. It does no longer exist. I've been in contact with Mr. Lund several times. I think he also sent you some material, so you've seen it as well. Uh, after looking at this, and the last place I had checked was the Historical Society. Uh, they had plenty of clippings, but nothing as far as a flag either. I looked at uh, Pont Hove, which uh, 
and some of you will have to correct me if I'm wrong, but apparently Pot of Pond Cove was once Robert B. Lunt School, and so there's a picture of Robert B. Lunt that is in your uh, conference room. I looked at him today while I was sitting there, as a matter of fact. So what I've done is to put together a plaque which would go with that. What I have done in the plaque, it says, in honor of Robert B. Lunt, Superintendent of Cape Elizabeth Schools, 1948 to 1969. So he was here for 21 years. In that period of time, for many of those years, he was a superintendent of Cape Elizabeth and Scarborough. And then the system changed and he became the superintendent in Scarborough. So 21 years is a long time for any superintendent. But I also put on there, Robert B. Lund Intermediate Elementary School, and I just noticed I left out a word. It should say dedicated 1963. And so that's what I am proposing for a plaque to be made to go with the picture. Is there a motion to that effect? So moved. Thank you, Peter. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Kathy. Any questions or comments? Um, will there be a formal ceremony for? I think something? we probably. I think we probably will. Yes. And we'll invite yes. Mr. Lunt to and his sister. Yes. And his sister. Yes. Okay. I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> Any other questions, comments? All I'm those in favor? <laughs> Six zero. Thank you, and thank you for following up on that, Alan. That was a, quite a bit of correspondence and legwork in terms of investigative. Um, consideration to appoint school board member as delegate to the MSBA's Maine School Board Association Annual Assembly, which is on Thursday, October 22nd. If you guys recall, as has happened, and we aren't responsible, we didn't do the calendar this year, <laughs> um, this happens on the same day as the parent-teacher conferences throughout all of our school systems. So in the past, or at least over the past couple of years, it's been difficult for some of us to attend this conference. Is there anyone currently planning to, I mean, you can certainly attend whether you're a delegate or not, and we don't have to send a delegate. We didn't last year, and I think those of us who did attend at least a few of the seminars did get some things out of it, a few of the sessions. Is there anyone who is definitely committed to going through the two days and is willing to serve as our delegate? Are we allowed to nominate people on the board? If they're, you can if they're attending. I guess they have the power to decline. Ooh, that's a dangerous one. Yeah. yeah. Do you have a nominee in mind? <laughs> No, she won't let me. Okay. Um, I would certainly say, encourage, any, seeing no one clamoring away, I'm, we'll assume that we won't send a delegate, but I would certainly encourage anyone once we get, I don't think we've received a no, schedule. We probably won't get it until early October. Um, and I would encourage anyone who has any time flexibility on those days to attend those. Okay. Oh, 7G, we have to approve the mentors, the yes. new item. Uh, okay. I think you all got that with your packets or else it was on your desk tonight. Yes. Uh, there are two, four, six, eight, nine mentors for uh, new teachers, either first or second year teachers. This is part of the plan. Uh, I know you asked me about this last time. Right now it's a part of the state plan for certifying excuse me, uh, teachers. And so Mary, Bruns, and um, <laughs> who else does that? I, I forgot now. Anyway, there are two of them who have trained these people, and they would mention yeah. Shari. That's right, Shari. Uh, and so they, these people, from Joyce Bell to Christine Tweedy, would be their mentors at this point in time. Mary? Not Mary. to continually beat this drum, but you said it's part of a state yep. plan. Is that funded by the state? No. Nope. Okay. <laughs> just want to point nope. that out. Nope. Okay. Nope. And what is the responsibility of? Mentors, what do they Basically do? what happens is, is, as you know, every teacher has to be certified as a teacher. Right. When a person comes in as a new teacher into the system, mm -hmm. they're probationary teachers. And so what is offered prior to the law changing, mm -hmm. this used to be done through the state, and it was organized through the state, but we still train mentors or, uh, for conditional certificates or probationary certificates. So what happens is you have a mentor for those people for two years who kind of work them into that process, answer the questions they may have, give them guidance, observe them in the classroom, et cetera. The difference is those people cannot be evaluators of those teachers. They can evaluate them from the perspective of what they're doing, but my administrators can't use the information they're using for a full evaluation of the teacher. That has to be done separately. Now, Alan, it's my understanding yes. that Shari worked pretty hard on developing this mentor 
role that is played. In Sherry and Mary both did, and yes. Mary, they yeah. both did. And so I, as I don't recall the specifics of it, but I do know it is a very valuable mm -hmm. and worthwhile thing to do if done well. And I'm assuming it is done well given the people <laughs> who so. orchestrated it and, and created it. So for whatever that's worth, um, I'd like to believe it's a good use of time, money, and certainly a tremendous support to new teachers. Okay, um, anyone interested in making a motion to um, accept this, these nominations? Fine. I move that we approve the uh, extracurricular position um, as detailed here as mentors for teachers, as presented by the superintendent. Thank it's you, Rebecca. Much. I apologize. Anyone winning, wishing to second? Second. Thank you, Karen. Um, we had a couple questions. Are there any comments or questions in addition to what's on the motion? No? Okay, all those in favor? Opposed? 5-1. Uh, Thank you. Um, committee reports. I think there might be a few. I know that some committees did not meet over the summer. Is there anyone um, wishing to make a report? Karen? Uh, well, <laughs> No, you did yes. before, so. Um, we, the Teaching and Learning Committee did meet on Thursday, um, this past Thursday, to talk, first of all, to have um, allow Alan to present to us the completed timeline, pretty much almost completed timeline for the um, workshops around curriculum coming up. And I think um, we're pretty much there. And I don't know, Alan, I don't know if you have a copy in front of if you want to speak in any more depth of that, or we don't have to take up the time to do that unless you would. I didn't bring the timeline with me. I apologize for no, that. No, that's, and that's fine. And then I, um, I know I've sent on to the other school board members any questions that you might have around the science curriculum to please send that um, my way so that we can make sure we get those very specific questions to the leadership team that's in place around the science curriculum so that it, um, at the workshop they will be fully prepared. And um, at that point in time, all of our questions should come in, so we're not gonna have surprise questions. We want them to be able to respond thoughtfully um, to any questions we have. And I should just add one more point to that. The discussion we had the other day was looking at the possibility of having uh, Steve and Jeff and Tom, I think it was Tom, mm -hmm. come in and talk about overview and how all these, those three programs, which are English, language, arts, math, and science, kind of interconnect with each other. And I sent them a summary of that the other day, and we're going to talk about it tomorrow at the DLT meeting. Great. Anything else, Karen? Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Okay, public comment on the agenda items. I don't see anyone from the public. Um, school board agenda requests. Are there any requests for future meetings? Okay, announcement of upcoming meetings. Again, just to remind members of the public that all the meetings um, and minutes of the meetings are posted on the website. Um, uh, teaching and learning, all the, the committees are there. The Human Resource Committee, I spoke with Linda this evening, who is home sick. Um, she will be scheduling a Human Resource Committee meeting. Um, let's see. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Thank you, Mary. Second? Second. Thank you, Karen. All those in favor? Thank you very much. Good evening. Thank you to the two students for being here this yeah. evening.